Hi there, I'm Dr. Paul Houle from Cape Cod Healthcare Neurosurgery, and I'm here to talk to you today about the transforaminal approach for endoscopic discectomy. One of the most important anatomic considerations that we must understand is the anatomic safe zone defined as Kamben's triangle. Kamben's triangle is defined by the medial, medially by the traversing nerve root, laterally and superiorly by the exiting nerve root, and caudally by the super, superior end plate of the caudal vertebral body. This anatomic safe zone provides us entry into the spinal canal without fear of injuring the exiting nerve root. The transferimal approach utilizes a rostral caudal trajectory whose target is the base of Cambus triangle. This is the widest point of Cambus triangle and the safest zone. The skin incision will get more medial the more rostral you go. Oftentimes I find that at L5-S1 my incision is 14 centimeters off of the midline, whereas at L1-2 it may only be 6 centimeters off of the midline. It utilizes the stage guide wire access principle or a modified Seldinger technique where a series of serial dilators is placed down over a guide wire. The thing that sets apart the Joymax procedure from other procedures is that in addition to placing a series of serial dilators, you're also able to insert a series of serial reamers to resect the non-articulating surface of the superarticular process, thereby enlarging the neuroforamen. I think this becomes particularly important when you're dealing with foraminal stenosis as opposed to just a soft disc herniation. When performing the procedure, it's exceptionally important to have good imaging. You really need to line up the end plates in both the AP and lateral projections. You really want to be able to identify your midline and have it be in the, the midline of the vertebral body and have it be in the midline because if it's rotated, you may actually be more medial than you imaging leads you to believe. Just remember that small errors in the beginning can lead to large errors in the end. The target is the superior end plate of the inferior vertebral body, which is the base of Camden's triangle. Remember that this is a transismic approach. So as you walk off of the facet, um, you will drop into the base of Camden's triangle. You want to have your needle touching the promontory on the lateral projection and be just medial to the medial border of the pedicle on the AP projection. In this short video, a guide wire is inserted through the needle, an incision is made, and then a series of serial dials is placed down to the facet. The goal here is not to enter the spinal canal, but rather dilate off the soft tissues for the crown reamers. We don't want the crown reamers to injure the soft tissue before they get down to the facet joint. The guide wires as well as the reamers are color-coded, green, yellow, red, indicating the progressively larger sizes. Next, you're going to insert the crown reamer in a counterclockwise manner. This avoids injuring the soft tissues. When you reach the bone, you're going to turn your reamer in a clockwise fashion. You're going to advance a little at a time, frequently checking fluoroscopy. The goal here is to not go beyond the medial border of the pedicle. If you go beyond the medial border of the pedicle, you run the risk of injuring the dura. And certainly the, the concern here is that if you go beyond the medial particular line, you do have the opportunity to injure the dura. And of course, uh, that's what we're all trying to avoid. But you have to think on all the surgeries that you've done, how many times has the dura gone more lateral to the, mid to the medial particular line? It never does. Thus, if you don't go beyond the medial particular line, you will not injure the dura. Again, this is why it's so important to have good imaging. You want to be able to define your medial particular line. And here's a good rep representation of what you want your reamer to look like respecting the medial particular line. The next step is inserting the tubular retractor. The tubular retractor has, is beveled with the opening of the bevel uh, in line with the handle that you use to insert it. Think of the, the long end of the bevel as a retractor. I insert it so that it, it goes underneath the dura and serves as a retractor. Thus, well, I know that when I get into 
with the endoscope, everything within the confines of the tubular retractor will be disc material and I can safely remove it. In fact, notice on this image, on this lateral image, the opening of the bevel spans the entire disc, disc space. Next, I like to identify bony landmarks. If you identify bony landmarks early on, you'll always be able to tell where you are. It's easy to get lost, especially when you start off, and so having something familiar such as bony landmarks is really advantageous. If you identify the pedicle and the facet joint, you know where the lateral recess is and thus where your neural structures are likely to be. You can then find the disc space to resect the disc. Of course, when there's a lot of degenerations, the reality is that sometimes it's not so easy to define your anatomic structures. So I like to think of things in a very simplistic manner. I like to think of how I'm not going to screw up. So I like to identify the structures that don't move, such as the pedicle, which is defined here by the purple hashtag. Um, I then identify structures that I could injure, such as the nerve root, which is defined by the green hash line. And I know that everything in between is going to be disc material, as identified by the white dashes. In this video, the exiting nerve root is running from 3 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And here the surgeon is bipolar in the annulus. You'll notice that there's really nothing pressing on the exiting nerve root at this point. And if this were a far lateral discectomy or an extra foramenal disc herniation, your surgery would be over. However, if the disc herniation extended more medial, or if this was a paramedian disc extrusion, you would want to look into the spinal canal. And we can accomplish this by rotating the cannula and the endoscope to look more medially. So here we have the view of the exiting nerve root and the lateral portion of the disc in the view. And now we're simply going to rotate the endoscope as well as the cannula so that we look into the spinal canal. Here you'll see some disc material being removed. And when it's removed, you'll see the pulsating dura, and you'll be actually looking underneath the traversing root, which is a unique perspective that only transforaminal endoscopic surgery provides. In this case, uh, you'll bipolar any epidural venous bleeding, and your surgery at this point is done. Which begs the question, how do you know when surgery is done? And this is the question I get asked at every single uh, course that I give. And I would say, I use the same criteria that I use when I do open surgery. It's something that you sort of learn over time. Um, certainly once you remove a very large fragment and you see that the nerve root is free, your operation's done. Uh, if sometimes I have to enter the disc space and I use the same criteria that I use from open surgery, mostly by feel, um, and, and that's the best advice I can give you. If the patient's awake, which is how I do my surgery, I ask the patient if their pain or numbness is gone. Also, I do my patients in the lateral position, and if they have a paramedian extrusion with the positive straight leg raise uh, preoperatively, I can perform that maneuver as well. You'd be surprised at how well a patient can tolerate that, and when a disc herniation is removed and the, the straight leg raise maneuver is negative, it's uh, quite rewarding to realize that you've removed that disc. You have immediate feedback from the patient. I also like to pass a nerve hook underneath and probe underneath the nerve just to make sure there isn't anything hiding. Again, similar to what you would do uh, in a regular open case. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, once I remove the tubular retractor, I place a little bit of pressure for a minute or so. I personally use a single subdermal uh, vicral suture followed by Dermabond. Other options include monocryl with uh, bacitracin ointment and a Band-Aid or a staple and a Band-Aid. I don't think it really matters. I personally don't use epidural steroids anymore. I did in the beginning. I didn't notice any difference. Uh, we also use an ERAS protocol in which patients get Toradol, IV Tylenol, and Gabapentin preoperatively. They're then discharged home from the recovery room when they meet discharge criteria. The transferamal approach is really a truly minimally invasive and muscle sparing procedure. I think. With the Joymex procedure in particular, the ability to resect the non-articulating surface of the superior articular facet to widen the neuroforamen is really the key to the procedure. And think about how many patients that you see who have had fusions 
or have already had laminectomies who have Baalbeck syndrome when really all they have is distal neuroforaminal stenosis. I think this surgery really has a useful role, especially in the elderly population since it's so well tolerated. The next best piece of advice that I can give you is to be patient. Trust in your uh, surgical abilities. Um, you will be able to do a very good job with this procedure. It's not as difficult as you think it is. Following the basic steps of needle placement, everything else will follow. Good luck.